education issues are taking centre stage in the run-up to the general election. But whose policies will improve your school, your work-life balance and your pupils' achievement? Welcome to Election 2010, Testing the Parties. Hello and welcome to the programme. We've brought together a panel of teachers, school staff and parents to grill representatives of the three main parties to get to the facts behind the promises. In the hot seat is Baroness Walmsley, education spokesperson in the Lords for the Liberal Democrats. She'll be facing our panel of school staff. Let me introduce them. Catherine Myers is the Royal Air Force Head Teacher of the Year in a secondary school in London. She's executive head of Bishop Chalna Catholic Collegiate School, Britain's first federated school. Steve Mills won Primary Teacher of the Year at the Teaching Awards 2009. He works at the William Ransom Primary School in Hertfordshire. Teaching assistant Trish Gribble is deputy director of the sixth form at Stoke Dameral College in Plymouth and is the TDA's Teaching Assistant of the Year. And Chair of Governors, Spiros Ilya, was awarded DCSF Governor of the Year for his work at Brindish and Hither Green Primary Schools. He's also a professional tutor for Teach First. Welcome to you all and to Baroness Wormsley. Before we take the first question, let's have a look at the Liberal Democrats' election pledges on education. This is what Nick Clegg had to say at the party's spring conference. And Liberal Democrats will give every child the fair start they deserve by reducing class sizes, increasing one-to-one -one tuition in our schools. Labour's target for school achievement is to ensure that at least three out of every ten children in a school get five good GCSEs. Three out of every ten. Imagine being in a class where just passing means you're the exception. We're teaching our children to drop their expectations. Liberal Democrats are the only party promising new investment in our schools. We'll be putting more money, two and a half billion pounds every year, into schools to pay for more teachers, better discipline and catch up classes. An average primary school could cut class sizes to just 20, ensuring children starting out at school have the personal, nurturing relationship with their teacher they need. An average secondary school could put the money into catch-up classes for 160 pupils, making sure no child is ever left behind. That is change that works for you. Nick Clegg there promising smaller class sizes and more money for catch-up lessons. So, Baroness Wormsley, before we go to our first question from the panel, um, we, go, we know about your pupil premium, uh, we know about a more flexible curriculum. Any other highlights you'd like to pick out? Well, I think I'd just like to emphasise that what Nick has announced is aimed at reducing the inequalities. Uh, every child should be equal in its opportunity to fulfil its own potential. And yet so many children come to school very, very disadvantaged. So that's what the money's there for. So closing and the achievement gap is what it's about. It is indeed. But the important thing is that it would be for the head teacher to decide how best to spend that money. That's really important to remember. We are not intending to try and impose on schools how best they should do it. OK, well, very appropriately, we're going to a head teacher for our first question. Uh, Catherine Myers, go ahead. John, the Liberal Party, the Liberal Democratic Party, talks of transferring money from unnecessary quangos, government departments, etc. Um, we rely on data to um, make school decisions, to make important decisions in curriculum. What quangos are you going to cut? Yes, we're not talking about taking away the very useful data that you have that helps you to make the right decisions. But the money for the pupil premium, the two and a half billion pounds every year, uh, would actually come from removing the child trust funds, uh, which give children the opportunity to have a good party when they're 18. We'd rather spend it on them when they're young. Um, and uh, also removing tax credits from the higher earners who currently get it, who perhaps don't need it quite so much. So it's a guarantee it won't come from elsewhere in the education no, budget? No, that's not where it's to come from. In the first year, we may not be able to use that money 
on education because of the economic situation. Um, Nick has said that he would like to use that money to stimulate the economy and actually a green economy, although some of the money, of course, might well go into uh, jobs, sustainable jobs in education. But it's really up to head teachers. And I, the other thing I want to emphasize is that this policy is not just to help the disadvantaged students because I think every teacher knows that um, if the most disadvantaged students don't get the help they need, it takes away the teacher's attention from all the other children as well. So really this policy would help specifically the disadvantaged students, but it would also help the other ones to get a fair well, amount of the teachers. Catherine, time. would you like to know yeah. more about this? And pupil premiums, um, yes. we hear that every child in free school meals is going to have an additional £2,500. Mm. So in a school like mine, uh, where there's over 50% free school meals, mm. are you going to put that money yes. as soon, if you were elected? Yes, it would, it would come to schools who take on the most disadvantaged children, but it's up to the head teacher to decide exactly how to spend yeah. it. But it would, it would probably be spent right across the school mm -hmm. rather than specifically focused on a, an extra assistant for that particular mm -hmm. child. And it's their choice how they but spend it. They get it for yes, every their pupil. choice every of how they spend it. On free, free school, school meals. meals. Absolutely. There's a pledge for yeah. two and a half thousand That's right. pounds. OK, thank, thank you. you. Steve Mills. Um, your new Quango, the Education Standards Authority, I was wondering what it would look like yeah. Who would be in the department and you know, what influence would it have on the day-to-day -day running of the schools? The idea is to replace two existing quangos, <coughs> um, the YPLA and the QCDA. Sorry, Ofqual and the QCDA. I think um, the important thing is that we have confidence that the standards that are being reported to us as the general public are right. There's, an awful lot, there's been an awful lot of this terribly demoralising for teachers, uh, doubting about whether the standards are really rising. Labour says it's rising, Conservatives say it's not. We think there's probably a mixture. In some schools, standards are rising tremendously. But there's a great long tail of students who have very chaotic backgrounds, poverty, deprivation of various sorts and difficulties that they need help with Doesn't that are not that. achieving what... Doesn't uh, Ofsted tell that? Do you need a new quango to tell you this? Uh, well, it's a quango to replace two others to make it quite clear what the standards are. And from there, then we can do something because a doctor can't diagnose a problem and, and uh, say what the treatment should be unless he knows very clearly what the problem so, is. So who will be in the, this new Independent authority? independent people. We worked very hard when the um, Ofqual regulations went through Parliament to try and make sure that it is as independent from government as possible and can't be manipulated by ministers. So existing practitioners, we, you know, heads yeah, and Yeah, absolutely. Teachers. People who know what they're doing. But people who don't have a party axe to grind, whose job solely is to tell the public, not the government, to tell the public what the standards are that schools are achieving. Experts, without not any politicians, doubt. without wishing to be Experts. rude. Politicians, yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Trish, next question. No, please. not politicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joan, um, most children now think that education means just what qualifications and grades you have. Mm. How do you feel about this and do we need to redress this? Yes, I do think it, it needs addressing. Um, you see, I, I strongly feel that children are not going to fulfil their own potential unless they're ready to learn. And mm. that means for many, many children that we have to address the background first. Now, a head might decide that they need uh, therapists, social workers, mm. a third sector organisation like Place to Be, uh, with the counsellors that they have and somebody to talk to for the children in the school in order to help them to settle the turmoil within themselves to enable them to learn. And that's where we come from really and we also think it's terribly important that we address the early years and that properly qualified teachers qualified in the early years are responsible for delivering early years education for every child. Tricia, happy with that? Um, yeah, well, how, how would the um, colleges be supported in that way then to provide these services that you say? So I, I agree that that is what's needed. Yes, if you actually, if you ask politicians of all parties, mm. what would most contribute uh, to, to better schools? It's high quality leadership and high quality mm. teaching. So we've got to make sure that 
um, young teachers coming through initial teacher training mm -hmm. actually get really good training and that when they go into the school they have an opportunity during their first year as a newly qualified teacher for additional mentoring and support and for uh, CPD and of course that should go right through the profession high quality and teachers sh should have a right to that so that's the approach that we would take seeing mm -hmm. it that when they qualify as a teacher, that's not the end of it. Mm. They need support and mentoring from the best teachers. The, the ones not just that are satisfactory, but the ones that are good or excellent. Okay, Spiros, and that it should go on for more question. than the first year. Uh, since the creation of the national curriculum, and especially since 1997, educational changes come thick and fast. Mm. And they're never evaluated. And the problem with that is that they, one, we don't know if they work, mm -hmm. and it's often at the detriment of uh, staff well-being mm -hmm. and the education of the child. Mm -hmm. How are you not going to repeat this same problem? I suppose because we come from the point of, from this point of view, when a, a new government is first elected, it thinks we've got to legislate. Well, there are lots of ways of helping heads and teachers and governors and as teaching assistants improve education, improve our schools without legislating. And the problem is, if the, uh, the answer, they think, to every problem is to legislate, then all you get is a great big pile of guidance on the head teacher's desk. And I expect Catherine and Steve are familiar with this. Um, and it, it comes thick and fast, as you say. So, so Spiros, the do you think that politicians would? I mean, it's easy to say in opposition, more difficult in, in government, isn't it, to, to keep your hands it's, off? I mean, his, it's, it's, history shows us that all politicians put, want to get their hands on mm. on education. Now, the, the, as I say, the educate the implementation mm. evaluation cycle is minimum eighteen months. Mm. Now, how, right. that that means any yeah. possibility of so really you give bringing, it at least eighteen months before you start to put hands I, on tiller. For know, bringing I bringing really... real time change, it yeah. means yeah. in the lifetime of of a government, it means you're probably two or three major changes maximum. Okay. You know, I, exactly. I think is it's the responsibility happen? of of a government to set up the framework. Um, an Education Freedom Act and um, uh, the uh, Education Standards Authority is what we would do uh, to make sure that schools and local authorities are accountable to the public for our community education system and then give schools the extra money that they need and give them the freedom. As far as the national curriculum is concerned, we would have a minimum curriculum entitlement and then let the schools decide on top of that what is most appropriate for their students to provide courses okay, on. Okay, we might come on to more of that in a moment when we come back to our panel for questions later on. Okay. But for now, we've also been asking for your questions on Twitter. And here's one from Mr Teacher. He says, uh, the Lib Dems will not win the election and surely, therefore, you can pledge whatever you like. Is that a fair comment? Well, in the last election, one in four people voted for the Liberal Democrats. If we could turn that to one in three, we could lead the new government. Because, you know, in 1951, only 2% of people voted for parties other than Labour and the Conservatives. In the last election, 32% of people voted for other parties. We've got a new pluralism in politics and uh, we would respond to that. We would obviously work with other parties. We do that in local authorities all over the country. But if you want what what I've described as Liberal Democrat policies, you have to vote for the Liberal Democrats. Because if we have an influence in their okay. ex-government, those are the things we'll be fighting for. OK, that's a nice and clear message anyway. Uh, we've also been looking for other questions elsewhere. Our reporter, Laura Turner, has been to speak to staff at the City Academy in North London. Here are their questions for Baroness Wormsley. Hello, my name's Dion White. I'm a humanities teacher and a literacy coordinator. This question goes out to Baroness Wormsley. In your manifesto, you talk about poor children are unlikely to get five good GCSEs in relation to their rich counterparts. I would like to know how are you going to make sure that this imbalance changes? Hello, my name's Faye Benson. I'm a newly qualified teacher. I would like to ask Baroness Wormsley, um, you've pledged to replace the national curriculum, um, but can you explain to me how it would actually differ from what we've currently got, as the elements that you said you're going to bring in, like the 14 to 19 curriculum, the diplomas, and more flexible teaching seems to already be in existence? Hello, my name is Gareth Lewis. I'm a teacher of English and Media Studies. I'm also a staff governor at the City of London Academy, Islington. My question for Baroness Wormsley is, what can your party offer 
in terms of equality of opportunity for young children as they begin their lives and go through their compulsory education. So, Jane Walsley, um, three questions there. Let's take them in order, shall we? The first one was really, I suppose, a, a closing the attainment gap between rich and poor again. How mm -hmm. would you do that? That's right. Well, that's what our pupil premium is based on. And unlike the Conservatives who've used the phrase pupil premium, ours is costed and we've said where the money would come from. And we've said that we would provide each school with the equivalent of what is spent in the private sector on the most deprived children. Are you happy that free school meals is, is going to be the best way <coughs> of identifying those people who most need that extra money? Free school meals is, is rather a blunt instrument. It is quite difficult. Um, but the, the advantage of using it is that I even in the more wealthy areas, you have centres of deprivation. And those children who, who have that deprivation would get that money focused on them, even though the general funding for the school may not be so generous because it's supposed to be in, in quite a uh, privileged area. Now, the second question was about your changes, your proposed changes to the national curriculum. How mm. different would it be? It would be very different in every school. <laughs> I mean, we think children have a right to a good education and the basics that will equip them for life. To me, education is for life. It's not just for a job. And there's a lot more to life than a job. Um, and that's why I think PSHE, for example, is so essential. And it would, that would be part of the basic curriculum because that helps to equip children to make their relationships in the future, to have self-confidence, to have respect for diversity and difference in other children and uh, all those good things which, which will uh, bring them out rounded, and would it well be a, a, human a, you know, a one-off reform and then leave it alone for a while? Yes, because we, we would just set up the minimum curriculum entitlement. We'd set up the Education Standards Authority to streamline uh, school accountability, which is so dreadful at the moment. Um, and, uh, and then we'd leave it to them. And it's really, it's up to head teachers to respond to the needs of their own children in their own community and the demands of the, the governors uh, in the, from their own community in representing their own community and then provide the curriculum that's right for those children to equip them for life. The third question was about equal opportunity for particularly for very young children as they begin yes. their lives. Mm. Everyone in education agrees that your very early years are terribly important. Absolutely Why right. don't you put your pupil premium money there rather than uh, throughout the later yeah. age groups? We have a second pledge that we would very much have liked to put in our manifesto and it's very, very close to our hearts. But because of the economic situation, we've had to postpone that because we, Vince Cable has been absolutely clear that we must be realistic about the current situation and the current mess that we're in. And that is to, uh, to give uh, some high quality nursery education to every child uh, from 18 months onwards, if the parents want it. And I think we all know that the best nursery settings actually involve the parents, because most of the time the child is actually at home. So it's specifically trained nursery teachers and uh, classroom assistants and nursery that's nurses. that's when you can afford it, you can't make as the As soon as we now. could afford it, we would do it. It's, it's one that we were very, very loath to drop, but sadly we've had to. OK, let's go back to our panel. Uh, Catherine. To on today's standard, the Liberal Democrats have said they would make class sizes smaller. Mm. And we, I wondered, is there any way that you have considered the modern classroom, for example, most classes have teaching assistants, they have technicians, etc. Right. So is reducing class size the best way to achieve higher standards? Mm. Um, and does it work with um, all the personalised learning um, initiatives mm. that are going on just now? Mm. In other words, is it out of date, to put it rather more bluntly, because no, it was a popular it, it, it promise was, in the past, but is it yeah, still relevant? It isn't actually, because Spiros just asked for um, evidence-based policy. And I'm sure you, you, Steve, working in the uh, primary sector will know the evidence that up to the age of seven class size really does matter. Uh, above that it's slightly less important. So we would expect that head teachers would actually make their decisions about reducing class sizes where they know that the evidence says this helps. Uh, but we wouldn't dictate it, but the money would be there to enable them to do it. Uh, but of course, yes, you've got teaching assistants, but you do need enough fully qualified teachers. Um, and you need the money to pay them. And of course, a teacher's pay has improved a lot, but we want to make sure that that okay. carries on. Do you want to come back on yes, that? Yes, I would like to come back on that. Mm. Throughout everything you've said, 
you keep mentioning that it's up to head teachers, you're yeah. giving a lot more freedom. Yeah. My concern is that's great when you've got the right head teacher. Yeah. What happens when you don't have the leaders coming yeah. through mm -hmm. and how is that going to be monitored so that schools go for three or four years um, without being yeah. inspected and they sink? So how would you approach that? Okay. This is where we come back to the sort of overall structure that we mentioned a little earlier on, because the Ed Education Standards Authority would um, make sure that local authorities did their job of supporting and appropriately challenging schools. So it's really up to the local authorities. We, we believe in local authorities because we think education is a community service. It's a service to in each individual child and its parents, but it's also a service to that community. So it really is up to the local authority. And we don't think local authorities have been sufficiently challenged as to how well they have supported head teachers. It is, of course, up to the governors to choose the head teacher. And we, we very much support what Labour have done with the National College of School Leadership and the research that they do as well as the training that they do and bringing through deputy heads so you've got succession planning okay. and those are great things. Steve. Uh, you, you've touched on the new minimum curriculum entitlement a, a, yes. a couple of times uh, so far. From a key stage two point of view what will that look like in terms of testing league tables or both? <laughs> <laughs> right we hate the league tables. <laughs> Uh, we don't think that they're a very appropriate way of um, making schools accountable. But will you get rid of them? Can you get rid of them? Well, what you can do is devise something else. And we've currently got these proposals for a report card. Now, if the report card is just on the top of all the other things that we've already got, then it's an additional burden on teachers. And we don't think that's a good idea. But if the report card was something which really drilled down into a school to see how much value they are adding to the intake that they've got, because currently the league tables only measure the intake, really. And the added value element is not really very major it needs to be much more concentrated upon There's some schools doing great work who are way down the legal league tables and that's appalling and in those schools the teachers get demoralized when they see that position Steve, go far enough what, the, the testing want. side so what are you going to yes. kind of use to uh, fill your report cards well we yes. uh, you could get rid of the test altogether that would get rid of the league well tables. you could but I think we should be relying on teachers professionalism teachers in ITT are taught about formative testing uh, in order to know what to, you know, how to guide the child in the next stage of learning. And I think we should concentrate on that and develop the teachers' professionalism and their experience of um, of assessing their children. Have some external monitoring to make sure that they're doing it at an appropriate standard. That can be done by sample testing across the country. But rely on the teachers' professional judgment. Absolutely. Okay, Trish. Okay, and um, what is your most powerful and lasting memory of your own school days and how has that influenced you? Right, um, it's particular teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most people have a particular teacher who inspired them. I had a teacher called Miss McLaughlin who was um, my biology teacher and she, um, she saw something in me, I suppose, an interest in natural history and the way our bodies worked and the way the world around us worked and animals and plants and the way they interacted. And she was able to draw that out of me and she inspired me. And that's why I went on to study biology at university and then subsequently to teach it. And now I, I chair an international botanic gardens plant conservation charity. So it's really gone right through my life, but it was a teacher. Spiros. Education is so paramount to the well-being of a society that it's inevitable that all politicians want to, get, want to get their hands on it. The problem is it then quickly becomes a sort of political football for people to score points and very much at the detriment of the whole child. Uh, would your party ever have the courage to take it out of the political uh, cycle so that politicians couldn't get their hands on it directly? Well, I think we've said we would do that in setting up the independent uh, Education Standards Authority and the Education Freedom Act that we would bring in. But actually, I'd rather like to quote to you something Paddy Ashdown said the other day when he was challenged about, well, why did you go into the House of Lords if you want to, uh, you know, abolish appointed peers? And he said, well, I only went into the place so that I could vote to change it and make it an elected house rather than an appointed house. So the, so the thing we'd like to do is to set up the structure 
and then go away and leave it to the professionals. Obviously give them the money they need, the training they need, the support they need, and let them get on with it. So this, do you, this you want local authorities to have more power? Are you happy with yeah, that? Well, so local local authorities authorities have more power we must have accountability, but it should be more through the local community rather than uh, constantly white or meddling. We'd actually cut the size of the Department of Children, Schools and Families. So this new setup would yes. actually have the professionals running it? Yes, and the... yes it would. Okay. It would. Right. Why buy a professional and try and teach yourself? <laughs> And just explain this Education Freedom Act, what does that mean? It sounds a bit gimmicky, to be honest. Mm. It would give all schools the freedom to innovate and to provide the uh, appropriate curriculum for their children, which only some schools have at the moment. When these various bits of legislation have gone through the House in the last six or seven years, to give certain schools certain freedoms, you will find that my colleagues and I on every occasion have said, well, if that's good for that school, why can't all schools have it? If you've got professionals in running all schools, they know their children better than anybody in Whitehall does, let them have that freedom too. And just in a sentence, do you think you'll be able to continue to resist you know, meddling when you're in government, or if you're in government, part of government, rather than in opposition, when it's easy to say it? Well, if I, I think if I and David Laws tried to stick our fingers where they shouldn't be, shouldn't be uh, I, I think Nick Clegg would s slap our hands very hard. OK. Joan Wormsley, thank you very much, and thanks to our panel as well. And I'm afraid uh, that's all we have time for at the moment, but if you'd like to join the debate, we'll be discussing all the education election issues on Twitter. Just search for Teachers TV News, or one word. And you can watch the latest education news every day on our website. Go to teachers.tv forward slash news. If you've missed the other programmes in this series, they'll be repeated on Teachers TV and available to watch on our website. Join us again for Election 2010 testing the parties.